All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the East Acre Community Call. This is episode 10. I'm Michael Giesen, also known as Invetica within the East Acre community. Along with me are a few moderators from the East Acre community. We have Superfiz, Lamboshi Nakagini, also known as Nolan, and Buddha. Uh, we also have our special friend, Patricio Warthalter, who is the founder of POAP. We'll be distributing a POAP uh, for attending this call. To do so, you're gonna go to the East Acre server. If you're not already a part of that, it's invite.gg slash eastaker. You'll enter the POAP channel there and you'll see a message by Wolf Halter uh, with the name of the POAP bot. And then you'll send a direct message to that POAP bot with the code word moon. All right, so I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm incredibly excited about today's call because we have our very special guest, Alan Murak from Blocks Staking. Hey. How's Happy to be today? here. Great to have going you. Well, going well. Now, with the forthcoming update to Ethereum 2.0, one of the core changes is the shift from proof of work to proof of stake consensus. And with that comes staking. Uh, Superfiz actually presented during the ETH Online Summit on the 23rd. And in that talk, he mentioned alternatives to solo staking, one of those being staking pools. Uh, I think. Why I'm so excited for today's call is because uh, though there are really only two paths to choose when staking, solo staking and staking pools, there are many variations of staking pool services. So with that, I'd like, uh, with your help, Alan, if you could kind of explain to us that may not already be familiar with staking pools, what they are in a general sense and what type of staking pool that blocks staking is. Sure. Um... And so in general, uh, Ethereum staking, as you've mentioned, is pretty exciting. It's, it's exciting for a bunch of reasons, which might be even can kind of get into. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, it's your ability to take your Ether and basically secure the network and also get rewards for it. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, there's a few uh, technical uh, limitations or challenges, depending how you see it. Um, two main ones. One is you need a minimum of 32 ETH um, to actually stake. And the second one is you have to have some kind of a specialized software running 24 seven because um, staking in Ethereum is very much an active game rather than delegating your stake to somebody else, um, which is very, very kind of maybe more common in other blockchains. Um, and so those, those two factors um, combined means that um, there's, a whole different economy of staking and different services and, and different ways to go about doing that, uh, which were probably, um, you know, that didn't need to be exist in existence before, but now obviously for Ethereum, uh, they should. Um, and so solo staking is obviously just staking 32 Ethereums, running your software and, uh, and that's it. And staking pools um, is basically lowering the barrier in, do in those two um, elements. One is you could stake any amount you want. Uh, and if built right, uh, you don't even need to run a piece of software uh, as, an, as an end user. Um, and so that's the, the goal and uh, maybe the scope of, 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 of staking in pools. Um, and of course, that's all of that is uh, under kind of the presumption that you're doing it in a decentralized way. Of course, you can always just take your ether put them in a, in a centralized staking service um, and they do everything for you. But of course you lose control over your coins. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So kind of breaking down the different variations of staking pools. Um, if we want to oversimplify this, we could kind of say that there's uh, custodial and non-custodial and everything between in relation to block staking. Uh, what are the stance that you guys take and how does that work? I mean, we started working on our staking platform about six months ago. And from the get-go, I knew I wanted to develop something I could actually use or I would use. Um, and so for me, it's definitely uh, the case where I want something trustless, uh, non-custodial, that is. Um, and uh, might it be a pool or even, even just solo staking, but it has to be trustless. I don't want to use, um, I don't want to lose control over my coins. Mm -hmm. And what is the minimum amount of staking needed to participate on your service on block staking? So blocks, blocks in, block staking in general has two phases. Um, and again, it kind of increments with the, the technical complexity. 
the first one is, um, of course, uh, just being able to solo stake in a trustless way, uh, but without the technical barriers of actually running software, running servers, infrastructure, and so on. And, and that's something we've uh, launched a beta for uh, about two, two weeks ago. Um, it's a beautiful user experience where you set up everything, uh, but you don't need to take care of the heavy lifting infrastructure and everything. Uh, and so that's part one. Uh, and that's really kind of the building block for, um, for staking pools because uh, we want to get a big user base, which actually does run software, which is phase one, which can then later uh, become node operators in staking pools and basically be kind of the basis for everything. Um, and so in staking pools, if we kind of run into the future a bit, uh, you'll be able to stake any amount you want, um, literally from um, uh, the, the smallest uh, decimal point all the way to uh, hundreds of ethers. Um, as an end user, you will not need to run any piece of software. Uh, you'll actually get a token representing the stake and the future rewards you'll get for liquidity. Um, and you still have those guarantees of of a decentralized uh, and trustless network, which for me, that's really the, the, the center of everything. Because, you know, if, if we're looking at the future of Ethereum staking and what it is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great financial instrument, that's for sure. But we need to also think that one of the main characteristics of Ethereum and all of the work put into Ethereum 2 was to make it as decentralized as possible. That was kind of the mantra from the get-go in Ethereum. And I think now it's kind of be beginning to realize with staking um, and so if we'll have a lot of staking services, which are centralized, uh, we're kind of undermining the very thing we want to protect. Um, staking pools networks need to have at least uh, technically the guarantees that the Ethereum network itself has. And so if we'll have a staking, um, a, a centralized staking uh, service, uh, might it be a uh, you know, solo staking or a pool? It doesn't really matter. If that staking service, the bigger the, it gets, the bigger the threat it poses on the Ethereum network, um, then we, we're in, a, in the wrong place, right? I mean, if you'll have a really big uh, staking pool, which can, uh, which is technically not solid as Ethereum 2 or has less security guarantees and so on and so forth, that can obviously be used for attacking Ethereum or just undermining the actual um, staking power or staking um, amount of ethers at stake, uh, which secure the network. And so those things are, are pretty tricky. I mean, uh, we need to make sure that the foundation is solid. Um, it's, it's great that we can make staking on Ethereum, you know, lower the barriers, make it more accessible. All of those things are really important, um, but it cannot come at a cost of lower security. Um, and actually we saw a few examples in the past. I mean, one of the reasons why Ethereum 2 took so long is because they really try to design it in a way that promotes the decentralization specifically for the blockchain. A lot of other blockchains just took whatever technology was available two or three years ago and tried to implement some proof of stake concepts. Uh, and some of them didn't succeed. Some of them got really, really centralized um, and, and because of technical issues they had. And so, um, you know, any future solution, any future services we have, we must make sure that they are solid um, and that's kind of where we come from. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a you know, big proponent of you know, making sure that you control your own private keys. It's, I think it's extremely important. I think it's in the basis of everything, which is crypto and blockchain. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, I want to build a service I would feel comfortable using. Um, and so that's kind of you know, our philosophy. Um, obviously, it becomes much harder technically to implement those things. Um, but I think that's worthwhile. That's why we kind of, um, in some cases, joined hands with the Ethereum Foundation because, you know, they have the, you know, the smartest guys uh, working there. Um, and so, um, you know, it's technically pretty challenging, but I think that's, you know, if I, if I need to kind of vision where Ethereum staking is going to, um, I want to, I want to, I want to, I'm kind of visioning it as a market, you know, a, a money market account where, you know, you put your money, earn interest, obviously secure the network as you do. Um, but you still have those fundamental guarantees. Yeah, yeah, these are make some fantastic points, and I really love how block staking is aligning with sort of the spirit of Ethereum. And, and you're looking down the road at how this um, affects when Ethereum 2.0 launches, and also 
um, trying to mitigate any negative impacts by by promoting a staking pool. So that's that's yeah. fantastic. I think we'll see um, as people adopt cryptocurrency more and um, experiment with different staking pools. I think the the question on everyone's mind is how do how do rewards work um, when staking in a pool? So how does that uh, work in relation to block staking? So it's actually something we we're still researching, but I think that we we have a good kind of lead or direction we want to take. Um, and so we've looked at a few a few things. So let's say you have a staking pool, you know, you solve all the technical issues, that's fine. You have uh, node operators which run um, the network basically, and then you have the end users which basically form the the actual pools. Um, okay, so now what are kind of the forces in play, right? So uh, in order to become a node operator, it needs to be economical because your alternative is always just run, you know, any of these standard, um, you know, Prism Lighthouse nodes, run your own validator, that's fine. Don't, don't participate in any um, staking network or staking pool network. And that's a bit, that's kind of a, a very appealing uh, alternative because at the end of the day, Prism, Lighthouse, those are, you know, they have the, the, their user base, they are, you know, they have a lot of traction and, and everything. And so the rewards should really reflect the fact that there's a big alternative for not actually participating as a, as a node operator. And that's one thing we, any, any economical structure has to take care of. The second thing is obviously the, the stakers themselves. Um, and so the stakers obviously will pay some kind of a fee because they're getting a great service. Uh, they don't need to run anything. They're getting the rewards and everything. So let's say you're taking some percentage of their, uh, you know, their re rewards, whatever the percentage is. Um, the question needs to be, is that reward enough to actually incentivize the entire network? Um, and now comes the tricky part because the fundamental idea of Ethereum staking um, is and I'm, I'm, I'm saying it in the, in the best possible way is low risk, low reward. That's the whole game in Ethereum staking. Uh, it's low risk because it's Ethereum. Uh, it's very solid. It's, it's you know, it, as, as, as long as you, your node is operating, you'll get the rewards. Um, you, you're, you do not expose yourself to any other uh, coin other than Ethereum. So that's the low risk part. And obviously the low reward reflects the, the percentage of, of reward from the total stake you get. So Probably the first year it's going to be 10 to 15 percent, but generally speaking, we're talking about probably three to six percent, depending on you know network conditions. Um, and that's that's an that's an amazing proposition. It's amazing an amazing proposition because in the world where in the world of crypto where everything is high super high risk, it's great to have a low risk low reward instrument. Um, it's it's the same as you know if you have some money in your checkings account. You don't necessarily go and buy a leverage stock, right? You, you might be buying some bonds or something like that because you don't want all of your money in high risk. Um, and so having that alternative is, is, is phenomenal. I think it's really, really interesting. The thing is that very property which makes Ethereum staking so good is actually making it hard to actually incentivize a staking pool because if the only thing you're incentivizing node operators on the staking pool is the actual rewards, then if those rewards are pretty small, then the incentive will be pretty small. And so you have to have some kind of a third party or, or an external um, economical force um, which can drive the network. And so you have to have some kind of a token dedicated for for the network itself, it's not a new thing. Every blockchain has it. You have to have some kind of an economical uh, driver behind everything. Um, and so you need to play with the economics of the token, the economics of actually uh, minting tokens as rewards for block producer or, or operators, whatever you want to call them. Um, and, and, and how do you make this economy work? And so the way we found it to work is um, you'll have rewards taking uh, or fees taken out of the rewards from the pools. Um, those fees get collected into a, um, a, you know, just a, a common pool where everyone can stake that uh, if the specific token for the specific network. Um, and, and staking that, net, that token does two things. One, it, it lowers um, token uh, velocity, which means that minting new tokens as rewards for the operators is kind of con counterpart uh, with the actual staking of that token because it lowers uh, velocity, meaning you know, less tokens are in circulation and so on and so forth. And everyone who's st actually staking those tokens can get a piece of the rewards or the fees of the network. Um, and so that mechanism works great because 
you have the token holders or the, the sorry the, the anyone who stakes getting a great service and obviously paying a fee for it you have node operators which get uh, rewarded uh, in in a, in a network token and then the network to token holders um, um, actually have utility because they can stake th those tokens and get a part of the fees from the network and I think that's uh, that's great to have kind of that um, you know completed circle between all the major players in that network um, and and obviously the market itself can play between how many people want to actually stake and get a piece of the fees how many people don't want to do that and do not want, want to lock their tokens and so on and it's beautiful because it's also the bigger the network becomes the bigger the fees are and obviously the bigger the amount of people can stake and get a piece of that reward um, that's kind of the current um, model we have in mind um, I think it's going to work. We still need to run some simulations, but it seems that it's a good enough, I think, economical structure, um, and and it makes sense for, you know, incentivizing people being a, uh, an operator on the network. It's obviously the the pool, uh, the, the end users who stake in the pools get a great deal, and obviously the token holders themselves uh, have a network they can be proud of, which whenever it grows the bigger the amount of fees can be distributed to anyone who was willing to stake the token itself. Um, and so that's kind of the model we have in mind. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, we still have to run some tests, but I'm pretty confident it's, it's something interesting, uh, which could find itself to production. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's awesome to hear the full scope of everything. Uh, kind of zooming in a little bit closer to block staking specifically, uh, I sort of acclimated myself to your services and, and the website and, and everything that you guys offer. I was really intrigued by the desktop app and uh, how it is you're facilitating the actual staking on your service. Do you kind of expand on that a little bit more and how sure. everything defaults to the app? Sure. So um, maybe I'll zoom out a bit. So as we kind of, I've kind of hinted before, we have two phases to what we're doing. Phase one is solo staking in a trustless way. Um, trustless means we blocks in no shape and or form holds any of the keys, uh, which is pretty unique, I think, offering in this space right now. Um, and uh, what it means is basically we'll have a layer of users which use and already are used to running some piece of software in a trustless way. And what we want to do uh, is when pools is ready, convert them or try to convert them to actually be node operators in the pools network itself and kind of bootstrap the network itself. And so what you refer to is phase one, obviously. Uh, the desktop app, it was a, just a result of, of you know, just technical challenges we had. We, we wanted to have a staking service where blocks doesn't hold any of the keys. Uh, basically all of the sensitive part of staking, which is the keys and operating a wallet, which signs those attestations and, and block proposals, we wanted that to be completely trustless. Um, and so that was a challenge because every, every other service, what they do is they hold the validation keys uh, and they give you the withdrawal key and, and, and call it a day because uh, it's easier to just operate that way, right? They're, they're running the validators. Um, and when you will be able to withdraw in, in the future, just use your key. The issue I have with this is, again, the bigger their services are, the bigger the threat they pose on everyone because the protocol is built, the Ethereum 2 protocol is built in a way where if you have a bunch of people get slashed together, their penalties go higher and higher in an exponential way um, by the amount of people get, who got slashed. So you can imagine um, a service where they hold the withdrawal, the validation key. Um, if they get really, really big and something happens, all of their users will hit, will get hit which much higher penalties. Um, so normally if you're a solo staker and you get slashed for whatever reason, probably you're talking about around 5% uh, damage, something like that. Again, depends on the network, but let's, let's assume it's around 5%. If, you, if you're staked with a big staking service, that could be up to 100% um, and even higher, but higher is obviously not possible, but basically lose the entirety of your, of your stake. Uh, and that's not something I want to be in. I mean, again, we're talking about low risk, low reward, right? So, and, and that's an important distinction because if the reward, if the risk goes high, higher than what it is right now, then maybe it's not even worthwhile to even stake, right? I mean, if the risk is really, really high, 
Maybe I don't want that 5% rewards a year, right? Maybe I'll just hold my ether in my ledger or whatever uh, security I'm, I have right now and, and don't stake. And so, and that's a, a solid alternative. Um, and we need to keep that in mind. And so we need to keep the, the risk really, really low. Now, m most of the time security risk is revolves around simplicity. So, you know, you take your ledger or your Trezor wallet. The reason why they work so well is because they're dead simple. The technology behind it is really complex, uh, but the user experience is really simple and they do it in a trustless way. So that's what kind of we try to mimic. So uh, in Ethereum 2, you need to run some piece of software. So what we did was we took a wallet. That wallet holds your keys. It's a hot wallet because it needs to be hot, uh, meaning it's online 24-7. It has internal slashing protection and, 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 uh, and security guarantees. And so that wallet has a very small footprint. And basically what we do is we take the desktop app you, you mentioned before. Uh, the desktop app is just a user interface. You choose where you wanna deploy that wallet, right? Uh, AWS, Azure, uh, in the future we'll have uh, you know, local installation and so on and so forth. You decide where you wanna install that wallet. That wallet has a very small footprint. You obviously install it in your own accounts Blocks doesn't have any access to them because the, the the desktop app is the one who does all the installation, automation, and all of those things. Obviously, it's open source and all of those good stuff. And so once you install the wallet, the wallet does signing, right? It has slashing protection built in. It has the keys. Uh, we're using HashiCorp's vault, which is really, really great uh, key management software, you know, uh, tons of years in production. And then we come and give you the infrastructure. So we run uh, Ethereum two nodes, Ethereum one nodes, we run a bunch of them. So there's always redundancy. We run Prism, we run Lighthouse. We do all the heavy lifting. The end result is you're running a very small wallet. If you run it on AWS, for example, it doesn't even cost you anything because it's so small, it fits into the free tier. Um, so it doesn't even, it actually even cost you anything. Um, and then we take care of everything, take care, care of everything uh, else, right? So if there's updates to the wallet, we just give them to you via the desktop app. One click, you install the updates, right? Um, the seed is obviously stayed on your whatever, wherever you wanna, you know, hold your seed. That depends on you. Uh, and the, when Ledger and Trezor will be ready, obviously that could be on their devices. Um, and uh, you enjoy, you know, a really, really solid infrastructure, wallet infrastructure from HashiCorp, which we developed a plugin for specifically for Ethereum 2. And so that setup, when we started to think about it, it made a lot of sense to me. And it, it was something I was, I said to myself, it's, that's definitely something I, I would use, right? I imagine that again, with the context of low risk, low reward, I think it's low risk because it runs on my own uh, server, on my own cloud. Uh, it's a very small footprint. It's used, it uses or an already established uh, wallet management and wallet uh, software. Um, blocks in even if blocks gets hacked a million times, the only thing that will happen is you don't get service from blocks, and so you always can get your seed, go to a different service provider. That's it. And so for me, it was a great it was a great solution. And so the desktop app have I'll make a long story short. The desktop app was really the result of we wanted to do that. And via web app, you can't really do that because there's a bunch of things you need to do internally. And so we decided to go kind of the ledger way. Ledger has their ledger live. And so we kind of copied the name. We uh, called it the blocks live. Um, but basically that's what it does. Um, simple installation, great user experience. We take care of all of the complexities and you don't need to compromise your keys. Absolutely, that's great. Can I add I something? <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. um, so just going back to the things you said earlier about non-custodial and custodial, um, I believe that it's very misleading, um, the term in itself, because some staking services define custodial completely differently than others do. Some say, oh, we don't hold your withdrawal keys. That means that this is non-custodial. Some say, oh, you have all your keys, um, but you have to use a third party app and which is sometimes not open source and call it non-custodial. Uh, that's not directed to you, just in general, but I believe that, that we should generally use a different term when it comes to non-custodial. Um, yeah, I, I actually agree. I think the, the right term should be trustless you know, or, or, or a trusted service, right? So it means that in some part you need to trust some other service 
for your secure personal security. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and, and so you're definitely right. I mean, some people won't be, uh, I've mentioned AWS and Azure, some people won't be, um, won't be comfortable using those and that's fine. And in the future, we'll have uh, a local deployment where you, you know, you can run it on your own server. There's not, no, no technical limitations on running our wallet on your own server if it's in your house or whatever, wherever you want it to. Um, so I, I definitely agree. Uh, for me, it's, I probably will use, personally, I probably will use AWS just because I don't have, um, you know, a local server. Uh, but I definitely respect anyone who, you know, doesn't want to have AWS as a, as, as a service provider, that, and that's completely fine. Actually, if you think about it, what we are offering is uh, more of an infrastructure provider, which is wrapped around a beautiful user experience. But at the end of the day, you know, you can take our um, desktop app or wallet, they're open source. Uh, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want with them. Um, it's, it, you know, it's not a great business for us, but at the end of the day, that's, that what, what we needed to do in order to promote transparency. And so you literally can take, um, you know, your, our wallet and our desktop app. And, and if you have some development experience, you can, uh, use them, uh, for yourself. Uh, so, of course we, we hopefully use us, but yeah. Well, if, did I understand correctly that if a user runs block staking, I tested myself today, I couldn't I yeah, tried I to test it, AWS, yeah. <laughs> but um, I was, does blocks run the beacon nodes in the background and the user connects to them or do they run their own beacon nodes? That's what I couldn't figure out. You mean, are, do you as a user run the beacon node or we run them? Yeah, so is the blocks app uh, also syncing its own beacon node or am I connecting to uh, yours? You, you're actually connecting to our beacon node. So okay. um, we run a bunch of them uh, behind the scenes. Um, and from a security point of view, you don't really miss anything because again, you have slashing protection built uh, internally to the wallet. So the wallet, which sits on your infrastructure is the ultimate, um, uh, authority to, if the, if it wants to sign or doesn't want to sign. So if the beacon chain, for example, let's say blocks gets hacked, uh, and, and somebody tries to ask the wallet to sign something, which will get it slashed, uh, the wallet will simply return an error. Uh, it will not sign it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and actually other attack vectors, which we kind of discovered along the way. So for example, an interesting attack vector, which wasn't really known, uh, was let's say you don't get slashed, but somebody asks you to sign an attestation five years into the future. So no wallet up until a few, uh, weeks ago could handle the situation and most wallets would simply sign. Uh, the attestation. What it basically means is it got you slashed outside of the usual slashing condition. Because if you think about it, once you, you want to sign an attestation three years into the future, you cannot sign any attestation in between. And so, you know, in a few weeks, you'll get slashed because of inactivity penalties. And so all of those small things are baked into the wallet and the wallet decides if it signs or doesn't sign. Um, and that's what I said before, that if we get hacked, the worst thing that can happen is we don't give you service. Um, and so you might lose a few, a few rounds of rewards, but you can always take your seed, uh, you know, and just use another service if you want. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I know you're concerned and we've talked about a bit of, 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 uh, on a bunch of them. Um, uh, and I, I'm just asking these questions because I believe that the community cares about them. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, there is another thing that I was curious about. So if something goes wrong, is there an insurance or anything that covers the uh, staker or do they lose their funds? Because I know that some staking services have some kind of insurance that covers the loss. Um, yeah. How, so how, if, if you're, sorry, go ahead. Uh, how, how does blocks handle losses? Yeah. yeah, so if you are using a centralized service which holds your validation key, I would definitely expect it to have an insurance. Uh, because we do not hold the keys, um, we don't have any way to know if what happened was happened for whatever reason is, you know, personal error, our error, any, uh, any other error, because at the end of the day, you were the one controlling the keys and we never saw them. Um, and so there's no real way to actually ensure that because there's, you can never know the fault um, of, of anyone, right? I mean, uh, because blocks never saw the keys. If we were a custodial service, uh, then definitely 
obviously the responsibility is on us because we are the one holding the keys. Um, it's it's kind of if you think about it, it's kind of ask, like asking Ledger if they have insurance on the Ledger which is in your house. Um, and and obviously the answer is no because they they can't really insure such a thing. Yeah. Would it be fair uh, to, to just to say that that your service is a beacon chain service rather than a validating service? Isn't that so? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 provides I, chain services rather than, you know, it's a chain service, not a yeah, not the other services. Yeah, that's what what kind of I've, I've mentioned <clears throat> before. If you think about it, we are basically an infrastructure provider. The thing we did uniquely was to wrap all of the solution where you know you get all the bits and pieces to set up your actual validator. Uh, but because it, we don't hold the keys, at the end of the day, once you actually install the validator, we just provide you the infrastructure. Um, of course, we develop the wallet, we develop the desktop app, we combine all of those things to get together. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you could say that definitely. I mean, at the end of the day, we're a very specialized infrastructure provider for Ethereum to staking. Yeah. Okay. Can I, you? I have, I have, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Can you, um, do you have a fee structure? figured out yet and can you explain how you actually collect those fees yeah we have a fee structure uh it's not finalized yet what i can say is that it's a per validator uh monthly cost and the monthly cost is a fixed amount so it's not a percentage of your rewards or something like that it's kind of a fixed amount whatever you you earn is yours um uh yeah i mean we'll, we'll probably finalize it in the next couple of months um but that's that's the structure. The structure. I don't have the numbers like how much it's going to be per validator, but that's the structure. Is is it priced in uh, dollars or ether? It, it's priced in dollars with the equivalent of you know the payment in ether the yeah, moment okay. you do the payment. Yeah. And that is that like a, a separate payment that people have to send? Yeah. Um, it... Yeah. It's, it's funny. It's funny you should mention because it's literally what we've discussed the, the past two days in the in the product discussions we had. Um, yeah, so it, you, you'll basically, if you think about the journey a user does, um, it comes to the, to the, to the to blocks, downloads the desktop app, it installs the wallet, and then obviously it needs to, uh, the user needs to do the deposit, right? So you'll have two transactions. One transaction is a deposit to the deposit address, the, the Ethereum official deposit address, and the other one is the fee address, which is up to our own contract. Okay. Has anyone run Simple Miner? It, it makes me think of Simple Miner, like... Um, it's, it's an old GPU miner, like you, it's a boot up disk and it has the interface and you, you mine directly through their service, but you pay them a separate fee. And I love that, that, that uh, you had set a shared validator key. It, the, the keys are entirely owned by the end user. Do you have a multi-sig in there or it's, it's entirely like the end user holds the, the seed phrase, they alone can generate the keys and they're paying yeah. you separately. Yeah, they're correct? alone generating the keys. That, and again, that's that's what you've mentioned before. At the end of the day, we're an infrastructure provider. So if you deposit and do not pay us, you'll simply don't get a service. Um, and but it's, the seed is still yours. I mean, you know, the deposit is still yours. We have no way to do anything with that. Uh, the only thing is, we can give you or not give you the service if you paid or not paid the fee. That's that's about it. Okay, I have two more questions. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, go ahead. Does does blocks have their own beacon node implementation, or do you guys use Lighthouse or Prism? Or? So we use Lighthouse, Lighthouse and Prism. But uh, what we did was, and it's kind of more towards the pools um, project we have. So the pools, and uh, it, it's actually let's call it the pools network because it's really it, it really is a network of its own. The network has two, basically two parts. On the pool, the pool level itself, we use something which is called secret shared validators, um, which is uh, an effort we did with the Ethereum Foundation to basically answer the question, how can you take one uh, validator, one private key, and split it up in a kind of a multi-sig way uh, between different, uh, different entities? Uh, and, and so it, it's a multi-sig, but it's a multi-sig with a consensus layer on top of it. For, uh, for robustness and everything. And so that's, that's part one. The second part is how do you connect all of the pools together for rewards, penalties, all of the things we've talked about before. 
And for simplicity sake, what we did was basically use um, the beacon chain structure. So the beacon chain has behind the scenes, it works on the Casper and Ghost protocols. Those are the consensus protocols for Ethereum 2. What we did was, um, and that's a project I personally worked on the past two weeks, was to take just the consensus layer out of the beacon chain in a way that uh, I can then use it to actually implement the consensus layer for the pools themselves. And so it's one-to-one -one identical to the spec, to the Ethereum 2 spec, uh, for Ethereum 2 spec phase zero, because it, when, when we go to phase one, it's, it's less relevant for us at least. Um, but it's identical to that. So you literally could take that code and run it as a Beacon node, but it's not gonna be a really good Beacon node because all of the optimizations, you know, the teams at Prism and Lighthouse did, but on the protocol level, it works the same. Um, and so we did that just for the pools network. I literally just tweeted it today, I think. Um, and so, and so, yeah, but, but it's, it's not an implementation of our own. What I will say is that we do have an implementation for uh, the engine behind the validators because we build a system which is a bit different from the validators uh, in Prism or, or in Lighthouse because we needed uh, to separate the signing from the actual logic of how the validator gets the different duties it has and how do you do it in scale, how do you do it in a, in a way which is uh, more robust with retries and so on and so forth. So we kind of implemented a different validator engine. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's a very involving, I guess, uh, project because of the pools part. Uh, there's a bunch of things which are very similar to Ethereum 2. And just for simplicity's sake, we kind of decided to use those things because they already work um, and they are already uh, in place. All right. And my second question, or me, I don't know if it's a question, but I think at its core, the Blocks app is a key management tool, isn't it? Because if you run it locally, there is no need for you to run the Block software if you can just run the node yourself because the Blocks software has to be online 24 seven anyway. So you could, could instead just run the Prism or Lighthouse clients instead. Uh, or, uh, just to clarify, uh, when you say the Blocks uh, software, you mean the desktop app? Or yeah, the yeah right. So the desktop app doesn't need to run 24 seven. It's just for okay. setup and user user interaction. What what runs 24 seven is the, is the wallet. We call it Key Vault. Okay. Um, that piece of software, yeah, I mean, you don't really need the, the desktop app to run it. I mean, at the end of the day, you can compile it and use command line for it. Uh, obviously, we build a desktop app for, just to make it easy. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> kind of talking about the desktop app, I noticed that um, I, I couldn't download on, on Linux. You've got Windows and... I know. <laughs> is, we is tried that it coming today. down the road, though? Definitely. I mean, we tried it today, kind of hack things together. Um, Linux is not tested yet. I mean, we have a, we have a version which compiled and kind of works, but has, it's buggy. Um, but because we learned a bunch of people from, from the community who really want Linux, that's probably going to be on the roadmap for the next, I guess, two weeks, something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely uh, I'll ping everyone, you know, when, when it's ready and, and, and hopefully you guys could test it out. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, but, by the way, if you have good. any, if, if you have another machine, um, you can, I mean, Windows or whatever, OS six. Um, you can use it there. Uh, Windows and, and, App and Macs are, are, are production ready. Um, at the end of the day, the security is always in, at the wallet level, right? So the wallet is, is installed on, on a Linux machine, obviously. I'd say you're, you're hitting a sweet spot because so many users are begging for Windows resources. Uh, right now, everything works just fine on Linux. So to have that switch might be, um, might be a great opportunity. Yeah. The only other question I've got here is, you, and you've touched on this uh, on what previous question, but I'm hoping you can kind of expand on it more is exactly what CDT is and how it functions within your platform. Yeah. So uh, when we talked before um, about the incentive mechanism inside the pools network, right, where you have uh, the fees which get collected and then you have uh, a, a mintable token as a, as a rewards for the block operators. And then anyone with, which is a token holder can stake and get a piece of those rewards. 
um, I, I just didn't want to mention it, but uh, we basically we're talking about our own token as as the, as a token which will uh, incentivize and really um, make pools become a reality because otherwise it's just not economically feasible. Um, and so and so that's the ultimate goal we see for CDT. Uh, for phase one, what you'll do is uh, the fee you'll pay is actually it's not a payment. You are actually behind the scenes will be buying CDT um, on Uniswap or whatever other DEX there is, and those tokens will get burned just as a precursor for how it will work uh, in the pools network. Um, so we're always looking to how, because of the technical limitations in creating pools right now, um, we're trying to have the first phase really as a way to bootstrap the network uh, once it's um, you know operational and ready, and so we, we want to kind of you know uh, draw the line uh, between what we have now and how it works now and, and how it will work in the future. Um, for me, it's really exciting because I think that's that's a token model. I'm you now we've thought about a million token models for, for um, the pools network, and this one I really feel comfortable with uh, on the technical level, on on just uh, you know just rationally. I think it's it's a great combination. Absolutely. I have a question. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, who do you see as your biggest competitor in the staking space and, and how would you say that you're different or better than they are? So I think that we are the only ones offering a service which doesn't hold any of the keys. I'm not aware of any other service which does that. Um, I think the biggest worry I'll have is really just to understand the market. Obviously, the market is not there yet because we haven't launched, but where the market goes. I really want the market to go to a place where people hold their own keys and do not you know, put their faith in centralized services. I think it's paramount. I think it's a key to the success of the entire um, you know, Ethereum 2 kind of concept and, and project. And so I think that's the biggest challenge I have. I think that you know, we don't know how the market reacts. We don't know if Binance and Coinbase come tomorrow and offer staking services and we'll take 70% of everyone who's staking. I, I literally don't know. Um, and again, just to kind of remind everyone what's, what, what's at stake, literally, the staking, the staking protocol in Ethereum requires less than a third of the, of the entire staking of Ethereum to be honest. What honest means? Honest means that they are following the protocol. That's less than a third, right? If two thirds, if, if more than a third of the entire stake is controlled by one or two entities, literally those one or two entities can dictate to everyone else. Why? Because when you have more than a third, the chain doesn't finalize, right? They can start manipulating the, the, the chain itself. And so that's exactly what at stake. I mean, if we get to a point where more than a third of the, st the entire stake is held by, uh, you know, just one or two or maybe three staking services. Um, that's really undermines Ethereum, um, especially because um, unlike proof of work, where you know in proof of work you still have um, uh, mining pools and everything, but it's very easy to get out of a mining pool because you're literally holding the, the hardware. In, in, in staking, you cannot move the tokens, uh, at least for until phase probably one or 1.5. Uh, and they're literally controlling the, the, uh, the stake itself. And so it's, it's much lower tolerances in terms of uh, big players taking a big chunk of the network. Uh, for me, that's definitely the biggest um, challenge. Um, if the entire network is DIY and everyone is running Prism and Lighthouse nodes, that's great. That's something I can, you know, I can, you know, you know, make my service better, make my service quicker, make my service more sexy and, and, you know, just make it better and hopefully I'll get those users. But if everyone goes to Coinbase and Binance, it doesn't really matter if I'm doing a trustless service because I, you can never compete with, uh, with that. Um, and so I think that's the biggest, by far the biggest challenge. I really hope that, you know, at least two thirds of the stake are in the hands of people who are control, in control of their keys. I really hope that that's the case. And if that happens, I, I pre I'm pretty sure we can offer a great service that people find valuable. Does anyone else have any questions at all? 
Uh, can you compare your service to something like Rocket Pool? Um, I think Rocket Pool has its technical challenges. Um, again, I don't want to pinpoint. I don't think it's fair. Um, but at the end of the day, the way I look at it is you need a service which has at least the guarantees of Ethereum, which means that if it gets really big, it doesn't threat its users or, the, or Ethereum itself. Um, and I think on that regard, they probably have some challenges as we do. Um, but I, I think their design is not exactly 100% compatible with that. Okay. And do you think after transfers are enabled, it'll be easier for them to match what you're doing? Uh, currently, no, because I don't think their problems is, are, is in, in, in how they construct withdrawals, because that's something which they can solve technically. Um, there's a bunch of other things which their design doesn't really solve. It doesn't really matter if you have withdrawals to contracts and everything else. Again, I don't want to pinpoint because it's not fair. They're not here to respond. Um, but, uh, but again, they have their challenges and, um, there, there's a reason why we, we've chose this design we, we chose. And, uh, there's a reason why it's more complex. Um, I actually have a question. How did you guys start a community? I mean, it's one of the best communities I've seen by far. Um, you know, if you have like a few minutes to tell the backstory, how did it get started? How do you get got here? Um, well, I think it was really super fizz that got it uh, really off the ground. Um, we were... I, um... Go ahead, go ahead. I started, it, I was an Olympic miner on Ethereum one and I enjoyed it, but I really felt frustrated that there was no community cohesion. We had a Reddit thread and we were back and forth a little bit, but I didn't really feel connected to the miners and being a very social person. I sort of said to myself, I would, I would do better if this happened again. Um, and I, I didn't really see all of this unfolding, but, um, at about the time that um, the first um, the first iteration of the 1500 ether deposit contract was scratched was about the same time that um, I decided to leave my job and, and be a stay at home parent. And I really just saw that opportunity to follow the development of Ethereum two and plant seeds to grow the community. Um, and it, it's taken a, a lot a lot of time of foundation work. Um, but I would say about a year ago, was it about a year ago, I, I messaged Lamboshi and said, hey, you want to, uh, you want to be staking buddies? And then that was the first link in the community and you want to take it from there. Yeah, we, really, on, we met because we both bought like unnecessarily powerful servers. <laughs> like big rack mount servers. So I was like, oh, okay, this guy, he seems like a good guy. Could be friends with him. It worked out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we've just, <laughs> definitely. just really been, uh, been putting a lot of time into allowing staking to be a social event rather than just a purely technological event because um, by building the community, we can now onboard people who have absolutely no previous experience with staking, we can make them feel welcome and we can help them prepare to be solo stakers on their own. And that is our act of decentralization. Um, by supporting other users, we decentralize the network by empowering them to stake. I, I mean, I think you're spot on because I think one of the only main factors that really distinguish Ethereum for any other blockchain project anything I've, I've been involved in in my entire life was is definitely the community i mean the the amount of talent the amount of um you know just the will to contribute to make a difference to do something is on you know it's unparalleled to anything other i mean it's really it's really amazing it's we have a ton of people who want to contribute and that's that's one of the things that really makes it successful 
Um, like we have a lot of ideas and then we have people stepping up to say, hey, can I take care of that? Can I help with that? Um, and so it, it really does help us um, grow and develop and expand. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy with the way things are going right now. Yeah, it's an awesome community, definitely. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, do... anybody in the chat have some questions? Oh yeah, good idea. I haven't seen any come through yet. While we're hanging um, out, we have just a minute. Um, yeah, and it could be a very good time um, for presenting what are those many initiatives that we are working in. Yeah. And so the, the first thing that we should bring up would be uh, the POAP for today's call. If you haven't claimed the POAP, um, Michael, do you want to talk about that? And then I will jump into the quiz game and the other things we're doing. Yep. Yep. So uh, for those of you who aren't aware of the Eve Staker Discord, you can uh, join by going to invite.gg slash Staker. And to claim the POAP, you'll enter the POAP channel and you'll see a message there by Warfalter. And uh, in that message, you'll see the direct um, at for the POAP bot. You'll simply send a uh, direct message to that bot. Just send the word moon, M-O-O-N. Great. Uh, and so I want to talk about two initiatives, and then I'm going to pass it back to Michael, because he's, he's actually developing another one for us. Um, the first thing that I'm most excited about right now is our quiz game. Um, I'm having, it's, it's getting off the ground. Actually, this week, it's really taken off. Um, in, I know this is going to be dated, and I'm sorry, but on Sunday of this week, I believe that's November 1st, we're going to hold the first Ethereum quiz game. Um, that is open participation to anyone in the community. All you have to do to get in is submit questions. We have a form. Um, it's a, a post on ETHSAKER. If you have trouble finding it, just message us in the Discord or wherever, and we'll get you to that form. Basically, you just submit questions, and that submission uh, gives you the opportunity to participate in the quiz game. And if you think that through, the more questions you submit, the higher the likelihood that you'll win the quiz game. Uh, the prizes are a little in flux, but we have several ether to spread out. And my minimum guarantee is that the 20 people who participate will get at least uh, one tenth of an ether. So that's about $40 just for playing the game. Um, what we're going to do is record that and then put it up on YouTube. And it will give the opportunity for people who are interested in Ethereum to watch that back and learn as they go. If it goes really well, we'll talk about making it a monthly initiative. But right now, it's, it's one standalone game. Um, enter questions, join us. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, and so I want to talk about one other initiative. It is the uh, collaboration groups. And that is, um, again, you can find us at, East, at East Acre. Uh You'll sign up, and our friend Jared, J.H., will um, assign you to a group with four other people. So you'll be in a private chat with five people where you can kind of uh, – develop a relationship and talk about staking, talk about your experiences in Ethereum so that you have your own little core group to work with. Um, and I really hope that by doing that, some of those core groups will grow and eventually begin giving back to the community. Um, I know that's how a lot of how we started, how our core group started. Um, and I, I believe that if we can uh, replicate that model, then we can really develop the community. Uh, and our biggest initiative lately has been the Ethereum Study Master. Michael, can you uh, take over? Yep. Uh, so like Superfiz said, we have the Ethereum Study Master that can be found at ethereumstudymaster.com. Essentially what that is, uh, the pilot, if you will, started on Reddit uh, where it was a vehicle in order to learn all things Ethereum 2.0 uh, with this uh, new update coming. It's sort of increased in scope to the point where We'll eventually be hosting individual courses ranging from the history of Ethereum, how to stake your own validator, um, and everything in between. So we'll, we'll expand as uh, new things come out uh, within the Ethereum world. Um, and each course that you complete, you then get a custom POAP proving that you've done that. And I do want to mention that in addition to earning POAPs for uh, or in the Ethereum Study Master, so are the other two programs that Superfiz mentioned. So the Collaborators program has a POAP and so does the quiz show. So if you're, if you're hunting for them, if you're trying to collect, 
these are these are the things. Uh, these are one of many things that you can do to participate in to collect. And I just remember that we deployed a new sticky on reddit.com slash r slash slash ETH staker. So the top post is our new sticky and it has links to all of us, all of that information, a welcome video. Um, that top sticky is really the best place to go for everything. All right. Anything, uh, anyone else want to bring up at all? Yeah, we had a question in the chat um, from Ben. He says, the issue of client diversity is floating around, but it seems this issue is slash will be strongly affected by large scale staking services. If they all choose to deploy PRISM, this could lead to an unhealthy situation. Does anyone on the call have a view on this? So do you yeah, have- I mean, I mean client diversity is, is extremely important. Um, are you, you're, so you're just going to be running like multiple nodes and if one of them should we, fail. Yeah, we, we currently it. run in production, we run uh, five prism nodes and one lighthouse node. Uh, we need to make some changes, but I think we'll ramp it up and probably have uh, around five and five. Um, we still didn't get to a point where we actually run different versions of each of those clients, which is also important. Uh, but that's the end result. I mean, the, I think the, the best thing you can do is have two or three clients, at least maybe two may, uh, versions, uh, one latest and one maybe one before that. And, and I think that covers a lot of it. And, and obviously have some kind of um, uh, uh, a health check between them. So you can actually know if something is wrong, right? I mean, if something goes wrong. All right. I think we're going to get yelled at if we don't tell you to run Teku as well. Some people yeah, are yeah, I, just, I, just, I, just, I just saw it. I mean, for me, it's the, the more the merrier. I mean, obviously, we have the capacity for our dev team. But I think that uh, Teku is actually doing a great job. I, I just saw the lat latest uh, ETH2 um, uh, node call, the, the, the community call. And they have some major uh, things on their way. And they, I think Teku has also did, if I'm not mistaken, a simulation for Ethereum uh, for um, ETH1 shard in, 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 inside Ethereum 2. Um, you know, I'm correct. Can everyone double check that? Which, which, by the way, that's really, really exciting. I think I, they did. I'm not entirely sure if that if the, that's them, but um, that's definitely exciting. We'll we'll get there. I mean, we'll we'll run them definitely. Um, so once the if 2 standard API is released and also uh, used for the clients, will it even matter which client you run? So if you could you spin up a Teco node um, in your backend and uh, I mean I it? hope it I, I hope it will get to that point, but kind of from you know from if I go to Ethereum one, even though Ethereum one does have um, some standards, you you do see differences between parity and and for example go Ethereum. Small stuff like how do you set up a static uh, node um, or static peer? It changes a bit. Some sometimes the logic changes. Of course, the you know the, the longer we run them, obviously those those you know differences will will uh, will you know just disappear. Um, there's another question. Yeah, the answer, Kirk, the answer is yes. I mean, we could, we already run um, a load balancer. So you could do, uh, so when, when your wallet gets um, a request to sign, that request is, uh, is atomic for a specific node because of various technical uh, needs. For example, to uh, subscribe to a subnet, which is specific for your committee. Uh, but what we can do is we can load balance the calls themselves. So, for example, if, if you set it up, you know, 30% Prism, 30%, uh, third, third of the calls Prism, third of the call Lighthouse, third of the call Taco, uh, you could do that. So then randomly you'll, you'll get um, diverted into, the, into a specific node, yeah. Anything else from anyone? All right. Well, Alan, uh, I really want to thank you for uh, taking the time today. This was incredibly informative. Um, do you want to so sort of chill out any anywhere where people can follow you uh, before we leave? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, 
block staking, check out our website. Um, I can give my Twitter if anyone is interested. I write a few, some sometimes a few things there which might be interesting. Um, let's see. So yeah, I'll just write it in the chat itself. Okay. And blocks staking, of course and boxstaking.com. Yeah, I mean, just check us out and let us know what you think. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye, everyone.